New revelations just out this moment after a manhunt that became one of the biggest stories of the year. Think back to last summer and the cross-country search for two young killers wanted for murdering three people in northern British Columbia. Well, we have newly unsealed court documents to tell you about today, obtained by CBC News and other media outlets who went to court to get details of the RCMP investigation. Thinking back to the summer, at the peak of the manhunt, such concern there were towns and communities across Western Canada on edge as hundreds of RCMP officers tried to track down 19-year-old Cam McLeod and 18-year-old Briar Schmigelski. Two remote communities in northern Manitoba became the focus for a very intensive air and ground search. It was a more than two-week-long search that ended with the bodies of McLeod and Schmigelski being found in thick bush near Gillam on August the 7th. According to autopsies, the RCMP say the two killed themselves. Um, but, of course, investigators say they murdered three people. And uh, at the time of the uh, rampage, police had nothing to link them to victims. First, the bodies of Lucas Fowler and China Deese found near Laird Hot Spring, and they were murdered next to a remote highway on July the 15th. Four days later, there was another body found near a remote highway about 500 kilometers away, and that was Leonard Dick, who was a researcher and instructor at the University of British Columbia. But there was confusion because a truck that McLeod and Schmigelsi had been driving was found burned out near that murder scene. And for a short time, police believed the young men, who told their families they were on a trip from Vancouver Island to Whitehorse, were victims too. So that brings uh, us up to date. If you were just to bring you up to date and remembering some of the key facts of this story. We're getting some details, as I said, in the court documents. We're also hearing for the first time from someone who may have narrowly escaped becoming a fourth victim. That's what he believes. Tanya Fletcher spoke exclusively with that man, and Tanya is with me uh, this morning uh, from our bureau in Vancouver. Let's begin with this man's story. Extraordinary. He thinks he, he escaped uh, two suspected killers. Tell us more about him, Tanya. Yeah, and Heather, it's not only that he thinks, but police believe this as well, according to these new documents. And this man is an Alaska resident. He'd been on a road trip down to Montana, and uh, he was with his wife and kids, but he had to come back early. So he was driving by himself and drove up through northern BC, and it was about an hour into the Yukon, uh, past uh, about an hour past the northwestern tip of BC. And he pulled over for a nap at the side of the highway, the Alaska Highway, because it was around midnight, he was getting sleepy. And just as he pulled off to the side of the road, he noticed a vehicle approach from behind, just creeping very slowly past him. That truck stopped on the highway. He says the passenger got out, the truck drove away, and that's when he saw the passenger was carrying a long gun. That man, he described him as a young man, walked across the highway near where his truck was parked into the woods, and he said that's when he started to circle around him and that he felt he was the target. And when they got closer to me, they slowed down very slow, uh, slower than walking speed. And then the passenger door on the truck opened and someone stepped out holding a long gun. And that got my attention. He closed the door and the truck drove off, leaving him standing there. And at that point, he started what I would call stalking behavior, slightly crouched, walking as if he's trying to walk quietly, holding his gun in what I would call a, a low ready position. About the time that he was roughly halfway to where, where my vehicle was, I see headlights approaching from the opposite direction. And as I'm watching these headlights approaching, as he gets closer, I see, wait a second, that's the same pickup truck that dropped this guy off. And as it got closer to me, it started to slow down. And at that point, I realized this feels like an ambush. If I don't take action quickly, I'm going to get blocked in. So I leaped over the back seat <laughs> in my underwear, started up the truck, put it in gear, and roared out of there. As I went by the truck, I, I looked directly, and the driver turned his head and put his hand up like that, like he didn't want me to see him. 
And so he peeled out of there and didn't look back. And it wasn't until days later that he realized this was in connection, likely as police believe as well with the manhunt. Uh, we have a few photos of the truck Ken was driving and the boat that he was towing at the time. And he realized later, once we heard um, the, the last will and testament, if you'll remember those videos, the two uh, young men had recorded shortly before their death, they'd mentioned in those videos that uh, they'd been hoping to take a boat and escape to either Europe or Africa and so after Ken Albertson heard that he figured that perhaps they were targeting because he had this boat and this uh, that he was towing behind his truck. Um, it was two days later after this encounter by the way that Leonard Dick was found dead. So this encounter happened right in between the two crime scenes and he says he can't believe to this day it still shakes him that he could have been the victim as well. But for the grace of God, there go I when I see those other victims. Later on in the year, I, I took another trip, and as I was passing these different places, I had more of an emotional reaction than I expected I would. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been in different dangerous situations at various points in life, but realizing that you may have been actually targeted by somebody intending ill will, it's, it's sobering. It is sobering indeed, and uh, again, just to bring to viewers' attention, Tanya, those are exclusive comments uh, from that man, and I'm going to tell people in just a second where they can hear more of the interview. It is fascinating to hear. These documents, newly unsailed, CBC and uh, various other media outlets going to court to challenge these, wanting to get access to the warrant documents, and they are really a treasure trove of new details. One of the, what are the, some of the most important things that we have since now seen. Yeah, so Heather, it includes a lot of information. We know now the, 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 the basis of the RCMP investigation and what they were going on, what evidence. Uh, included in these documents are some new photos as well, and we have a, a, a surveillance image. This is the day that the two young men left their hometown, and not far from Port Alberni where they lived was Nanaimo, about an hour away. And so they actually were seen purchasing legally one of the rifles at this uh, sporting goods store in Nanaimo on the CCTV footage. And so it was that very day that they they left and then headed up on their trip uh, en route to Whitehorse to find work. Um, also in the documents, you can see they're heavily redacted. So for example, we know that all of the victims, we know they were shot dead, but it, it appears now we know that there were a lot of other injuries that all three victims suffered. For example, uh, taking through um, Leonard Dick's uh, injuries, these are all blacked out, all redacted, but it's believed that they suffered before they died, and so we still don't know. The biggest question of all of this is why, and I think that'll be something that remains haunting the victims' families and, and the suspects' families as well. They just can't wrap their heads around why this had to happen. Even with all this information, still have not been able to uncover the motivation. Tanya, thank you very much. Big story today, just breaking out of Vancouver.